And I would like to give you an overview of treatment and a little bit of diagnosis of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing in the world. Some hallmarks of patients with NETS are that the symptoms, as Dermot said, are initially diffuse. Uh, there is a long doctors and patients delay in many cases, and more than 60% of the patients have metastatic disease at presentation. And the growth rate is variable, and it can also vary in the individual patients from time to time, which means that the disease can be stable for periods of time, then it can start to grow and then be stable again. This is a short overview of the ENETS classification. Uh, grade one tumors with less than two mitosis or K67, which means percentage proliferative, proliferating cells less than 2% or up to 2%, G2, 2 to 20, mitosis and 3 to 20%, and grade three tumors more than 20% proliferating cells. And then you have to realize that within those grades there are, of course, uh, a great variability. There has been suggestions to, instead of having 2% as limit, uh, to change this to 5% for grade <coughs> 2. <coughs> Something about the tumor biology. Uh, this is the, the staining in when you're doing biopsies, uh, histopathology. These tumors express the neuroendocrine markers, chromogranin A and synaptophysin. We have specific markers to test for, such as serotonin, which can indicate if the tumor is originating in the small bowel or somewhere else. PTF1 positivity indicates that the tumor comes from the lung. The proliferation marker, K67, is very important. It's expressed in percent of proliferating cells. And this is one of the basis for how we decide uh, the treatment of the individual patients. And the mitotic indicator, of course, the somatostatin receptors, one to five. I can just tell you a few uh, reasons for non-tumor associated increases of chromogranin A. Chromogranin A is a very valuable marker, it's sensitive. However, it's less specific, especially in patients with decreased renal function, type A gastritis, Patients taking proton pump inhibitors such as meprosol, and patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease or uh, impaired liver function. When diagnosing these patients, uh, apart from the biochemistry, we have several radiological methods. CT scan should be performed in three phases, the native phase, which means without contrast, Contrast IV, two phases arterial, which is an early phase, and the portovenous phase. Many of these tumors are only detectable in the arterial phase, and this is important, and the timing is very important. MRI is an alternative, ultrasound plus biopsy, endoscopic ultrasound. Octreal scan, Dermot said a few words about it, which is somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. And then we have the PET scan, positron emission tomography, gallium dota taco dota tate which is much more sensitive than octreo scan. 5-HTP, we can only perform this in Uppsala. It's a very specific method. Gallium is sensitive. It's less specific than 5-HTP. And then we have FDG, fluorodoxoglucose in patients with rapidly proliferating tumors. Uh, the advantage is when, with the gallium, dototac or dototate pet compared to somatostatin Receptor scintigraphy is that no cyclotone is required. It's more sensitive. Uh, we may use it for radioactive tumor targeted treatment. Uh, that has, however, not been studied yet, and it's a one stop procedure, as Dermot already told you about. You can come and go the same day. The aims of treating patients with neuroendocrine tumors are the following. Of course, we want to relieve the symptoms to improve the quality of life. This is especially important since you patients, you live for a long time. You should have a good quality of life. 
we can achieve that by medical treatment and by reducing the tumors. We also want to decrease the tumor mass and the tumor gr growth in order to prolong the survival. <coughs> and how do we do that? We have several options. Uh, surgery, which rarely is curative but often palliative, debulking with surgery, radiofrequency ablation or embolization, which can be performed with particles, chemotherapeutic agents or radioactive particles. We have external radiotherapy against bone or brain metastasis mainly, and the PRT with lutetium or ritium. We have medical <coughs> therapy, chemotherapy, biological treatments, some statin analogs, alpha interferon, mTOR inhibitors such as the rolimus, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for example, sunitinib. And factors influencing the therapeutic decision type of net tumor, the TNM stage, and the grade of tumor. The stage means how spread is the tumor, the grade, how aggressive is the tumor. The extent of liver involvement, the functioning versus non-functioning tumor, tumors uh, producing hormones, causing endocrine symptoms, need additional treatment, patient's performance status, the availability of different therapeutic modalities is important, of course, and somatostatin receptor expression. And the treatment of most patients is a combination of surgery, PRRT, and medical treatment. And I would like in at this part of the presentation to tell you that all patients should be treated individually, regardless of the guidelines or whatever experts say. You should be judged and treated individually because each patient is unique. You're, all of you sitting here are unique and you should have a unique treatment. Of course, it must be based on experience, studies and so on. And the guidelines are guidelines, but they are nothing else. I would go through a few of the studies and make a few comments. This is the PROMIT study. Uh, octuotide LAR, 30 milligram every four weeks, compared to placebo uh, in patients with the uh, carcinoids. And you can here see that octuotide LAR uh, prolonged the progression-free survival significantly with about half a year <coughs> compared to placebo. And it was the uh, same in functioning as non-functioning tumors. Uh, And this is the Clarinet study comparing lenreotide autogel 120 milligram versus placebo in patients with non-functioning meds with low K67. And uh, about 40% were originating in the pancreas and thir one third in the small bowel. Uh, what is important with this study you can see is that the tumor grade uh, about two-thirds of the patients had a, a proliferating rate of less than 2%. Uh, and the, the results, it, there was a significant prolongation of pro progression-free survival in this study. Uh, uh, the progression-free survival in patients with, uh, treated with placebo was about 18 months and it was not reached with lenreotide. And this is, of course, very interesting uh, to know that many patients can uh, be kept on the real time. However, the problem is that the progression-free survival of 18 months is a very long time in patients treated with placebo. So what we have to assume is that and this, the patient population in this study group was relatively slow-growing, relatively uh, less, uh, very low malignant tumors. <coughs> and the subgroups, uh, the effect of mid tumors was consistent with the others, and as well as in pancreatic tumors. Um, yes, uh, hey, here you see the uh, uh, results. Uh, see, uh, again graphically. 
the indications for somatostatin analogs, uh, uh, what I think, all patients with metastatic small bowel carcinoids should receive a somatostatin analog, um, sandostatin LAR or somatolin autogel, and all patients with the carcinoid syndrome. In patients with functioning endocrine pancreatic tumors, glucagonomas, VIPomas uh, should have it. In patients with ACTH-producing tumors, if you don't uh, perform an adrenalectomy, which you usually do if the tumor is metastatic. Patients with gastrocnomas can, however, be treated with the proton pump inhibitors, which is much more, it's very effective in controlling the symptoms and it's less expensive. In patients with non-functioning endocrine pancreatic tumors, lung carcinoids, and rectal carcinoids with low proliferation, you may consider uh, some statin analog treatment. And here is the study, the Swedish study about interferon in patients with small bubble carcinoids. Uh, interferon plus octreotide versus octreotide plus placebo. And you can see that the curves are separating. There was a difference, however, it was not completely significant. Uh, it may depend on that there were two few patients or that there is no difference. Indications for interferon in patients with small bowel carcinoids. Uh, well, patients with unresectable metastasis, patients with uncontrollable syndrome, peritoneal metastasis, and patients with uh, low K67. Today, I usually treat patients with interferon if they progress on smetstatin analogs, but I also, in some patients with uh, a very heavy tumor burden or patients, especially with peritoneal metastasis, I start with interferon. And patients with pancreatic nets with low K67 or uncontrollable uh, VIP production can also be considered to receive additional interferon together with somatostatin analogs, especially if they progress on somatostatin analogs. Here is a study, uh, a recent study about strepsotocin plus 5-FU, which is a chemotherapeutic combination used in patients with pancreatic nets. And you can see that uh, there was a partial response rate of more than 40% in patients with pancreatic nets and an overall time to progression of more than a year. And this was published this year on the ASCO GI meeting. And here is a study from our own group uh, regarding tempozolomide in patients with uh, foregut tumors. Foregut means pancreatic, lung, thymic. And what you can see is that there was a partial response rate of about 14% uh, <coughs> in patients with lung and uh, less than 10% in patients with pancreatic nets. But uh, many patients had a stabilization of a progressive disease. And the conclusion from this study is that tempozolomide as monotherapy is active in a lot of patients with uh, tumors originating from the pancreas, lungs, and thymus. And here is a study from Florida. 30 patients with pancreatic nets treated with the combination of tempozolomide plus capsitabine. And uh, they had a 70% partial response rate and a median progression free survival of one and a half year, which is impressive. This is the radian 3 study of Everolimus plus sandostatin LAR versus placebo plus. Uh, Sandostatin LAR in patients with pancreatic nets, and the uh, primary endpoint was progression free survival. And the result was a prolongation of progression free survival with about six months in the Everolimus treated patients. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the same as the ClearNet study uh, almost three years ago or almost four years ago now, this was in January 2011. The same number, the same issue of New England Medicine, this study was published, uh, sunitinib, 37.5 milligram per day, com compared with placebo in patients with pancreatic nets. 
And this study also showed a progression-free survival prolongation of about six months in the active group. Uh, the side effects from Everolinus and Sonitinib, you can see here Everolinus, stomatitis, rash, diarrhea, fatigue, infections. What you have to, re to know is that non-bacterial pneumonitis is not so uncommon in these patients. And sunitinib, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, asthenia, neutropenia, abdominal pain, hand foot syndrome, uh, stomatitis, and nose, nose bleeding. So they have pretty many side effects, these drugs, but they may be ameliorated by, uh, for example, uh, reducing the dose, you have to, in some cases, give steroids against the pneumonitis, you can use uh, ointments against uh, skin problems and so on. So now I'm going to say a few words about peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, or PRRT, in patients with NETS. And there are two possibilities, lutetium octreotate or yttrium octreotide. We use only lutetium, I will tell you why later. Lutetium has a, a half-life of about a week. It emits beta particles and uh, also gamma rays. Yttrium has a shorter half-life, two and a half day, only emitting beta particles, <coughs> but with more energy than uh, the beta particles emitted from the lutetium. Indications for PRRT. Well, you must have a tumor uptake higher than normal liver uptake on the octreo scan. And the bone marrow and the kidneys are the dose limiting organs, so you must have an acceptable function of the bone marrow and the, the <coughs> kidneys, and also of the liver, and the life expectancy of more than three months. And the contraindications, tumors accessible to surgery or radiofrequency ablation, decreased bone marrow, renal, liver function, Patients with massive liver metastasis with high uptake, there is a risk for <coughs> severe liver dysfunction if you give these patients uh, uh, PRT, so you have to be a little cautious. And you must be, abil must be able to be isolated for uh, 24 hours and to take care of your own personal care <coughs> when you're isolated. We want uh, long-acting semester analogs discontinued for four weeks before the treatment. This is not an absolute requirement. If you have taken your injections uh, more close to the treatment, it's possible to give the treatment and it will still be working because we know that uh, the lutetium will still adhere to the tumors. Interferon, however, must be discontinued one week before and pegintron two weeks before. And we have uh, developed a protocol for individualized dosimetry when we scan the patient after the first treatment of one, four, and seven days after the treatment and the following treatments the day after. And we normally give about between four to six treatments with about two months interval. And here are the results from the Dutch group three months after uh, the last administration, and you can see that they have a response rate of 30% if you include minor response, 46%, and another 35% stable disease. What's important is that patients with stable disease or minor response may have a further improvement up to 12 months after the treatment. And they have had a medium time to progression of 40 months and a median overall survival <coughs> of more than 10 years. And here is the Basel experience with yttrium. <coughs> and you can see that the response rate is roughly the same, about 30%, and the disease control rate of about 40%, and the medium survival from diagnosis of 94 months. The problem with, here, just before that, I will say about a few words about quality of life. And this is, uh, analysis from the Dutch group also, 50 patients <coughs> with neuroendocrine gap tumors followed up with um, this uh, 
questionnaire before and six weeks after last cycle. And what they found is that several aspects of uh, quality of life increased significantly and patients with regression most frequently had improvement in quality of life. Fatigue, insomnia and pain decreased. And uh, their conclusion was that lutetium improved the quality of life in several functions and reduced symptoms in patients. And that's consistent with our own experience. Most of our patients feel well. <coughs> they feel better than uh, before the treatment, which in part may be due to the fact that they get rid of all the toxic drugs such as interferon chemotherapy, but it, it seems that lutetium has an inherent improving activity in patients with NATS. Uh, a few words about the side effects with PRT. Hematological side effects grade three to four occur in about 10%. In patients with yttrium, there was uh, about 9% had severe permanent renal insufficiency, which is important to know. We don't use yttrium at all. We only use lutetium. Uh, as blood malignancies, severe blood malignancies are unusual with both these treatments. Uh, this is a study about lutetium in patients with varying proliferative index. And what you can see here to summarize is that patients with G three tumors, which means a key 67 of more than 20%, had a much higher risk for progression on the treatment. Um, I would not say that a proliferative rate of more than 20% is an absolute contraindication. We have seen patients with higher proliferative rate responding to the treatment and responding for longer periods of time too that you have to, to consider if the patient instead should have chemotherapy or if you'd start with chemotherapy and if the patient has remission, give uh, lutetium instead. This is a summary of the response rates with PRRT, about 30% response rates with both yttrium and lutetium and uh, pro another stable disease in about 52 and so uh, about 80% of the patients, 80 to 90% have a beneficial effect of this treatment. And the response duration is about three years. So which patients should be treated with PRRT? I have summarized this on this slide. I will say a few words about radioembolization, which means liver embolization with yttrium 90 labeled microparticles, which means that you have a high dose of radioactivity delivered to the liver metastasis, and also, of course, the health the liver gets is part of uh, the radioactivity. And you have to perform a, an angiography before to clarify the vascular anatomy and a scintigraphy to assess the lung shunt because the particles should go to the tumors, not to the lung. And the um, study from United States showed a partial response rate of uh, about 60% and another 25% were stable. <laughs> and there were no patients who had more than grade three. And there was a median survival, of, as you can see, of 70 months. So their conclusion was that uterine 90 surgery is, is safe and effective, and that's our opinion too. There is no studies comparing uh, radioembolization with bland embolization. So I would give you uh, a, f a treatment algorithm. There are no studies, at Dermot's, as Dermot said, uh, proving what should we start with, what should we continue with, in what order should we take the treatments. These studies need to be done. But of course, you should consider surgery. Uh, in small bowel nets, in patients with low proliferative rate, biotherapy, semester analogs, maybe interferon or a combination. 
and the targeted radiotherapy. Patients with intermediate proliferative rate, biotherapy, senescent analogs, interferon, and the targeted radiotherapy. There is some indications that everolimus plus senescent analog may have some effect in these patients also. We use this in progressing patients. And in patients with high proliferative rate, biotherapy, senescent analogs, targeted radiotherapy, of course. In these patients, we consider chemotherapy, especially if they are progressive. And, of course, patients with the Cossidone syndrome should have a semester analog for symptom control. Normally, we don't treat these patients with chemotherapy unless they have a high proliferative rate. Uh, and uh, this is a, a treatment algorithm in general for patients with metastatic NAT, low proliferative rate, biotherapy, everolimus, plus SMS or sunitinib, plus minus SMS, chemotherapy, <coughs> strepsotocin, plus FIFU in patients with uh, uh, pancreatic nets, patients with intermediate proliferative rate, chemotherapy, strepsotocin, plus FIFU, doxorubicin, temozolomide, plus minus capsitabine, everolimus, sunitinib, and of course, the mastatin analog for symptom control. In patients with high proliferative rate, more than 20%, uh, chemotherapy with the carboplatin plus etopside, temposolomide plus capsitabine, and or bevacizumab, which is a vastin. And uh, I can, what we do here is that in, in this patient group with a high proliferative rate, if they have a proliferative rate below uh, roughly 50%, we often start with uh, temposolomide plus capsitabine plus minus a vastin. If they have more than 50-55%, we start with platinum-based chemotherapy. And then, of course, we have the targeted radiotherapy, yttrium or rotetium. And except in patients with small bowel nets, except those with high proliferative rate, no chemotherapy. And which order should we use this? Well, we don't know, as Dermot said. This is an individual decision. We have to take all those factors into consideration I previously outlined for you, uh, including bone marrow renal function, general conditions, mastatin receptor expression, proliferative rate, extent of disease, and so on. And uh, the what uh, avail available treatment we have. Here you can see. Uh, uh, survival curve of patients with metastatic carcinoids. Uh, the three lower lines are from United States, and the yellow line is from an expert center, namely Uppsala. And you can see, as Dermot said, and also Tommy and all the other here uh, speakers have uh, stressed that you should be treated in an expert center in order to have the best survival, the best quality of life. And this specialized center includes the multidisciplinary teams with oncologist, surgeon, nuclear medicine, pathologist, uh, gastroenterologist, endocrine oncologist, the uh, patient support group, the tumor board, and of course, in the center, the patient. Always the patient in the center. Always. Always. Uh, what about the future? We have to explore the, t uh, the class uh, WHIO TNM classification system to improve the therapy. We must individualize the treatment based on the tumor biology, the molecular genetics, and we need completely new therapeutic modalities. For example, vaccines, oncolytic virus, viruses, nanoparticles, new chemotherapeutic agents, new targeted agents. And with that, I thank you for your attention and thank you for coming here.